21, Matthew chapter 21, verse 18, asking God all week long what to preach. And I, I was going this way, and I thought I had it. And I said, hallelujah, I'll preach that. Yep, that'll work. Revelation, I'll, I'll preach uh, about the, the faithful church and how they persevered. And, and uh, they were small, little, but they, they had little strength, but God helped them. But then but then I just wasn't working. I don't know why, but it just got uh, kind of came to a stop on that one. I said, well, I can't go any further. And then I thought, well, I, I, then I got another message. I thought, yeah, I'm going to preach on, on uh, filling the oil, uh, the lamp with oil. And we're going to, you know, how long we mourn over Saul and, and fill the amp and go with oil and gold. You know, I thought, I thought well, I'll preach on that. That would be a good message for, for this. And I thought I was all gung-ho about that. And then I woke up uh, Saturday morning and God told me preach this and I go okay all right I got it that's the way it is for me that's what happens that's trying to find God that's trying sometimes I miss it but that's just trying to find the mind of the Lord on these Uh, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 18 now in the morning as he returned into the city he hungered and when he saw a fig tree in the way he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only now, here come, here's a fig tree. It should be producing. And there's no figs on this. And Jesus wants to eat from this fig tree. And so because it wasn't producing, Jesus said, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. I mean, just like that, withered right there. Now, verse 20, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And that's a different way of saying things. But basically in our language, we would like, we'd be like, wow, did you see how fast that fig tree withered? That's the same thing. Okay? And, and then it says in verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them. Now this, this really is the text. Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, that kind of power, he says, he says, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Look at that, verse 22. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall have it. You shall receive it. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the power of faith. Okay? I want to encourage you. The devil has beat down our faith and is trying to cause us to think that God doesn't answer prayer, that God, or that God is a little God and not a big God. I want to help us here this morning minister on the power of faith. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray for your help, your strength, your blessing to be able to minister thy word today. Thank you that I have the opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk. I do not take it lightly. I pray for the mind of the Lord, the strength of God. I pray, Lord, that your people would be strengthened. I pray that they would have faith, revelation of thy word, that you would speak to their hearts. And may you be glorified as we lift up your name. And so we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. Praise God. Amen. The power of faith, Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22. And I'd have to say that without a shadow of a doubt that everything pertaining to this church and ministry has always been by faith and not by sight. When I say everything, I mean everything. Not exaggerating you that have been with us for a long time. No, that we've never seen it. Uh, We've never had it. But we always took that step of faith, uh, believing God for it. And when I say this, I'm not exaggerating, for it is a miracle that we're still here today preaching this gospel of Jesus Christ. It's only by the power of God. But not only that, but by God's people believing God for the impossible. Now, when our backs have been up against the wall, God's people, the church, have cried out to God by faith, and God answered their cry. God has shown himself faithful, and there's no doubt that he helps. There's no doubt that he strengthens. There's no no doubt that he nourishes and provides as we go to him believing by 
faith. Amen, church. From the very beginning of coming to Ohio, my family and myself, 1997, uh, to ministering in Bluffton, Ohio for two years, to coming to a city that we never knew existed in Marion, uh, has always been by faith. I mean, always been by faith. When we came to Bluffton, I didn't have a job. In fact, I left a good paying job in Louisiana to come to Ohio. We simply believed God by faith. God told us what to do. We prayed and we sought the face of God. God confirmed what we were to do. We were to come up to Ohio and do the work of God. So we stepped out of the boat and we began to walk on water, spiritually speaking. We were believing God. We saw the miracles of God. We saw God providing. Every time we turned around, the Lord was helping, strengthening, guiding, providing, doing something and showing himself real in our lives. We felt the compelling and the calling of God to follow him. Just like Abraham, when God called out to him to leave his hometown, his own country, to follow God, we felt the same. We sold what we could. Now listen to me. That's what my family did. My wife and I, we had Michael and Matthew, uh, Michael and Morgan at the time, and and we sold what we could, loaded up that U-Haul, and we headed north. My wife and my two children at the time, Matthew would come in a couple years down the road. But it was simple, childlike faith. We didn't know much. We didn't know how how to do what we were doing. We didn't know what we were doing or what we would face. We were just trying to follow God's lead. That's all we were doing. We are nothing spectacular. We're, we're just normal people, amen, trying to follow God. But we just simply trusted the Lord and His call. And sometimes I will have to say that we make faith or we make believing God a whole lot more complicated than it really needs to be. See, God had spoken to our hearts about being in ministry. He spoke to our hearts about being in Bible college. So I went to Bible college, and now God has spoken to our hearts about moving to Ohio and working in a church in Bluffton. We simply set out to do God's will for our lives. I left a good paying job. It was more than a job. It was my career. I went to college for this. This was my career. This is what I wanted to do most of my life at that time. I was making over $21 an hour in 1997, folks. Some folks aren't even making that now. This is 2019. I had great benefits. I, I, I was I was succeeding and excelling in my career, doing very well. But our heart and our passion was to follow God and to do His will. My life is now His life. It's whatever you want, God. Crucify the flesh. I'm dead to myself. Not that that's not a continuing work in my life, it's the, the consecration and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. But I'm dead to myself. I'm willing to leave it all, family and friends and things that are, uh, that are familiar to me in the city of Baton Rouge and the good old Louisiana Cajun food and, and our, uh, everything, the job, the, the security, the benefits of the future. I'm willing to give it all up that I might follow God. That's the beginnings of this church. That's the beginnings of this church. Like Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I had and still have this tremendous conviction within me to preach this great gospel of Christ. Listen, my beloved, I am human. I'm not perfect. I've gone through so much, highs and lows, and in between. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there with me. Many times I said I quit. Many times I give up. Many times. I throw in the towel. I say I'm done. But the next day, the Lord wakes me up with this conviction and says you must do what I've called you to do. Whether you're healthy or whether you're sick, whether things are going good or not, whether you have money or not, doesn't matter. I've called you. Necessity has been laid upon you. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. I've taken a lot of flack from people through the years. You preach too fast. You preach too slow. You preach too loud. You, you, they say that you're legalistic. You're too uh, uh, dogmatic and all this kind of thing. I've, I've taken a lot of flack uh, through the years of preachers, uh, uh, people that want to come and tell me how to preach. Uh, but listen to me. I love you and with, uh, not, to, uh, not to disrespect anybody, uh, but I don't preach legalism. I, I preach grace, uh, uh, but I preach a balanced grace. I, I don't preach law. I preach that there is hope in every message and there's a way of salvation. 
situation and you can have victory in your life. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient. The cross is the answer. Jesus is coming back and you better hold on. Hallelujah. You better hold on, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It is the answer. It's the power of God to set men free. It has the power to change lives to everyone who believes, and that choice is up to you. We didn't have a job in Bluffton, but we believed God anyway. The church that we went to was small. In fact, at that time, it was about half the size of this one. They could only pay rent of the house that we were staying, cute little white house there, and it was $450 a month, and they could only only afford that for the first year that we were there, but God provided. God met every need in our life, and God blessed my family. Now, why did he do that? It's because we stepped out by faith and we're believing the Lord. God will bless faith. God will bless obedience. But I remember that, you know, $450 a month, that's all that we're getting, so we've got to have money for food and clothing and to pay the utilities and things like this. I tried working at Sears, uh, selling TVs and stereos and things like that. And that uh, I, I think it was the second month. I'm going to tell you how God was blessing me. I'm not a salesman. I don't like to be a salesman. I don't care for that. But I had to make my money for my family. I got to provide it for them, so I got to do something. It was part time. But the second month at Sears, I was number one sales. Hallelujah. See, God was blessing and God was providing. But even in all of that, I was only making about three or four hundred dollars a month in sales. <laughs> You get a percentage, some small percentage of that. So it wasn't enough, maybe 500 a month. It wasn't really enough. So I remember one day going to Finley, and I saw this uh, building uh, called Cooper Tire. Never heard of Cooper Tire in my life. So I stopped by, and I turned in my resume, and I talked to someone who looks at potential hires. But he said that they didn't have a position for me. But how many know that God provides, but God also has another plan? See, my wife and I just kept trusting God. We were living by faith. About a month later, I received a call from Cooper Tire. They said that they had made a brand new position. Brand new. They never had it before, but they wanted me to come in for an interview. I can say that God is working behind the scenes. It may not look like God's doing anything, but for that month, God was orchestrating and God was working and God opened up and made a position and they called me up. Hallelujah. Amen. And they said they like to interview me, and how many know that God opens doors that no man can shut? Amen. And so when I came in for the interview, that interview lasted for four hours. I never had an interview in my life that lasted that long. Four hours. Amen. I talked to so many people, and I was honest with them. They all asked me, why did you move to Ohio? I told them because I'm a youth pastor working in a church. I just graduated from Bible college, but I worked at Exxon Refinery. They had my resume, and they're asking me all kinds of questions about me, about my faith, uh, about my ministry, about the church, and they couldn't believe that I came up here uh, stepping out by faith. They just looked at me and marveled that I did that. I thought, well, it's no big deal. I'm just doing what God said to do. And so I talked to many of them, but they thanked me for coming in and said that they'd get back with me. Well, several weeks had passed by, and I didn't hear anything. No letter, no phone call, nothing. So I figured somebody else got the job. In the meantime, my pastor and his family, along with my family, went on a two-day trip to Michigan and Canada. I don't go to Michigan much, but that was years ago. And when I got back, there was a message Hey, man, there was a message on the answering machine. Now, cell phones weren't too popular back then. Remember, remember cell phones, they had bag phones in the car if you could afford it. But they, remember, they had the pagers. But pagers don't do any good if you don't, can't find a phone. So I didn't have any of that. Answer on the, uh, and they were on the answering machine, and uh, the call was from a man by the name of Mark Johnson at Cooper Tire. And he said they'd like to hire me. And so I called him up the next day, went in to meet with him. And Mark Johnson, he asked me, he said, how much would you like to have per year for your salary? Well, I knew that my rent was taken care of through the church. I knew that was satisfied. And we didn't have a lot of bills. I wasn't trying to rob anybody. I wasn't trying to take advantage of anybody. And I really didn't know the position that they wanted me to do. So I just said, well, how about 30000 a year? I mean, I don't know. Anything is good. I mean, I had been making 44000 a year with benefits at Exxon, but, but you know, it's, it's okay. I'll, I'll 30000 I thought. I don't know what I'll be doing. And he said, well, that's a good number. He said, but it's not enough. I go, really? He says, how about we start out with 36000 a year? I said, I'm not going to complain or argue with that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I thought, man, hallelujah. How many know that not only does God provide, but he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think? He's a big God. Say it with me. He's a big God. 
He's a big God. He's a big God. Hallelujah. I wish somebody would hear this today. You cannot outgive God. We always, we, we shorten ourselves. See, when we don't properly give to God, we're saying we don't believe you're a big God. We don't believe you can provide. We don't believe you can meet the need. We don't believe the Bible. But when we give to God, we are saying, we believe you're a big God. We believe the Bible. We believe you can provide. We believe in miracles. We believe that God is able to do and to meet every need in my life. Amen. <laughs> now, in God's foreknowledge, are you okay? Amen. I get excited when I talk about the testimony of this. In God's foreknowledge, he knew best. Now, I didn't know, but God knew that after being with that church for one year that they would quit paying the rent. Now, I'm not going to get into all the things that happened, but they quit paying us after one year. God told me that. God told me. He's about the 10th month. God said, after one year, they're not going to pay you a dime. And he was right. After one year. And I'm no prophet, but you can hear from God. And so God already knew that but, and provided me a job with just the right salary to take care of my family. 36000 a year. But listen, faith believes God regardless of circumstances or situations. See, God made a way. He opened a door where, where there was no door. He created a position for me so that I could put food on the table and clothes on my back and take care of my family. See, Jesus said, if you have faith and doubt not. If you have faith and doubt not, don't let the devil rob you of your faith in God. Don't listen to the doubting devil. Don't listen to his lies. God is still God, and God is just looking for a people that will believe him by faith, live by faith, ask by faith, trust by faith, cry out to him by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus said, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Now, that word desire, that, that doesn't mean your fleshly desires, but that means that your desire becomes his desire according to his will. He says, when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. Friend, we serve a big God and he knows our need before we even ask. But faith will ask. Faith will pray and faith will cry to God. Faith will knock on heaven's door. Don't say that we have faith when we don't pray. Come on, church. Somebody hear me on this. Don't say that we have faith when we don't pray. Don't say we have faith if we never bow the knee. Don't say we have faith if we don't apply the word of God to our lives because it takes faith to apply this wonderful book, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes faith to apply the word of God. My wife and I went through some hard and difficult times. We weren't always treated right by the church or by the, the, the spiritual leadership of the church, but God was with us and God was faithful and God provided every need that we had. We just wanted to make sure that our hearts were right with God and that we did everything according to his will. But we had faith in God and that is the key this is the key that unlocks the, the doors of heaven having faith to believe God regardless of situations or circumstances my back has been up against the wall many times but I always had hope because although I was backed up against the wall I always believed God I can always pray I can always go to the Lord I can always cry out to God hallelujah praise God amen there's always hope just to let you know how good God is, I have to tell you the rest of the story, all right? <laughs> it gets even better than this. After we came to Marion to start a church, now, God laid it on my heart to start a church. I'm in Bluffton, and, uh, and I didn't know where to go. I mean, I, I, I felt like we were to stay in Ohio, and so I was looking. I put a map of Ohio, the big fold-out maps, on the kitchen table. Kids went to bed. And I'm looking at this map, and I've been praying for some time, for several days, weeks, asking God, when do we go and where do we go? And, and we've already turned in our notice that we're leaving at a certain time from the church, and, and we've already turned in our notice to the people that we rented the house from that we're leaving at a certain date. And I had no place to go, and I told my wife, it's not going to be long, we're going to be homeless. And so I'm looking at the map, I'm looking north. But I didn't feel to go north because Pastor Jerry's north. I don't want to, if I'm going to go north, I'm going to go to his church. But he didn't have an opening at the time because he already had an assistant pastor. And so I thought, well, I'll go south. I thought maybe the Lima area over there. But I was working at Cooper Tire. And so I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. And I'm looking around. 
And then all of a sudden, I'm going back and forth on the, on the hallway uh, in the living room, back and forth into the kitchen, the dining room. And I come back and I look at this map and I said, God, where do you want me to go? And all of a sudden I saw it. Boom, big bold letters, Marion. I've never heard of Marion. Marion leaped in my heart. You know what I'm talking about when I say leaped? Something bursted in me, just confirming. And I told my wife, that's it. We're going to Marion. I couldn't sleep that night. I said, honey, we're going to Marion. We're going to Marion. This was a Saturday night. I said, after church, we're going to pack up the kids. We're going to run the van. We're going to come over to Marion real quick between services, and we're going to check this place out. It was, a, it was winter. It was cold. It was an ugly day. And, and, and we came to Marion. We didn't know the, how the layout of Marion was, and we went right down here and into the older part, into the old, the old building that's all, you know, the big, big, all that equipment used to go in there and stuff like that, you know, and just not the very pretty part of Marion there. And, uh, and, and it was an ugly, winter, wintry day and my wife says no we're not coming here she liked bluffton i said honey i said we got to pray about this i said we we don't have much time we got to find a place to live and so forth and, and and just trying to tell you a little bit about the story and i said god if you want us in marrying you've got to do a work in my wife's heart well that time came along to make a long story short when it was time to move here uh god did a work in her heart when we moved to marrying that first day we both said we feel like we are home we didn't know anybody but we felt like we were home we were home we were home this is where god wants us there's no better place to be but in the center of the will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, after we came to Marion to start this church, there was no bank who would give us a loan to buy this building. We were rented the YMCA for six weeks. We're in another building for two years on Bell Fountain Avenue. But then we came into this uh, building here and lending money to a church is a risk, especially a new grassroots church. And not everyone who calls himself a pastor is genuine because there are people that are, have false motives. And so I really can't blame the bank. Uh, we were leasing this building that we're in now with the option to buy it, but no bank would help us. Every door was shut tight. I went into the Marion Bank at the time. It was the Union Bank, the Ohio State Bank. I don't know. It's, it switched hands through the years, um, but I would go in there every week and make deposits. I talked to the loan officer all the time, telling them my plans, gave them the report of what we're doing at this church. But when I came down to borrow money to buy this church, although the loan officer tried his best, he said, the board shut you down. He said, you're high risk. He said, I'm sorry, Mark. I tried everything I could. I said, it's not your fault. I walked away with a smile, but inside I was mad. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I was upset. And I went to several banks in Marion. I went to several banks in Mansfield, but nothing opened up. Nothing. It looked hopeless. I was lying on the couch one Sunday afternoon asking God what to do. Every door shut tight. I was so discouraged. I was down. All the options were shattered, but I was asking anywhere. Laying on that couch Sunday afternoon, God, help me. Gotta help me. We don't have a bank. We don't have a, How are we going to get this church and get a loan? Help me, God. Help me, Lord. What do I do? I'm laying there on the couch. I'm kind of in a half sleep now. You know what I'm talking about? Just kind of a twilight zone, you know. Some people stay there, live there. But, you know, I was just kind of in that twilight zone. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to my heart. Isn't it good when God talks to you? Listen to this. This is how good it gets. While I was laying on the couch in twilight zone, suddenly God brought back to my remembrance that my ex-boss at Cooper Tire, Mark Johnson, had quit his engineering job at Cooper Tire and took his father-in-law's place as CEO at First Citizens National Bank. Hallelujah. Come on. It gets better than this. The next day I called him. I left a message. He was out of town. A few days later he got back with me and told me to come up to Upper Sandusky and we will get you the loan. That's all he said. You come on up here. We'll take care of you. A few weeks later, we signed the papers, and the deal was done. Only God can do that. God brought me to Cooper Tire. Didn't have a job. They opened up a new job, hired me. Mark, uh, Mark, uh, Mark uh, Johnson became my, 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 my manager, the engineer. He quit at a certain time, became CEO of First Citizens National Bank. I quit Cooper Tire, needed a loan, and God brought me to him. I'm telling you, God orchestrated the whole thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's how God works. But it all came as we believe God by faith. Every door that ever opened for us has always opened by faith and not by sight. One of the great problems with the modern church of today is that we have faith in God if it looks possible. 
But true faith doesn't look at circumstances, but it rises above and soars with the eagles. Hallelujah. It believes God no matter what. It has the undeniable trust in the living God and His Word. See, the people in whom God delights in are those who rest upon His Word without doubting. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. Therefore, doubting God's Word is sin. Church, I want you to know that. If we doubt His Word, it is sin. Because doubt never comes out of faith, but rather out of unbelief. You see, this stems from the lower nature, the carnal nature, or the fleshly man, the edemic nature, if you will. But see, God has nothing for the man who wavers. For they are like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind, tossed about in every direction, back and forth, back and forth. They're unstable. You cannot count on them. They never receive anything of God. Only believe, my beloved, can I help you today? Because all things are possible with God if we'll only believe by faith. I want you to get this down in your soul, in your heart. Believe Him. Trust Him. Go to Him. God has a plan beyond anything that we can ever known. He, he has a plan for every individual of life. And if we have any other plan in mind, then we miss the grandest plan of all. Listen, Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Uh, friend, nothing in the past is equal to the present, uh, and nothing in the present can equal the things of tomorrow. Tomorrow, for you and I as a Christian, uh, should be so filled with holy expectation uh, that we will be living flames for Christ. Uh, the church is not dead. Uh, she's a living dynamo. Uh, it should be filled with God and His power turning uh, the world uh, upside down uh, everywhere we tread. Amen. All right, now, let me take a moment here and visit the story here about the centurion, about the centurion soldier. Hey, man, you see the account in the gospel according to Matthew, and it's in chapter 8. Uh, the centurion soldier servant is sick. You know the story in the Bible. The servant was at the centurion's home very sick with some kind of palsy and some kind of grievously tormented. And Jesus said, I'll come and I'll heal him. But the centurion does something that would catch most people off guard. He said to Jesus that he didn't have to come to his house, but all he has to do is say the word. You don't have to, to be there physically, Jesus. Uh, your word is enough, my friend. That's powerful in itself. Most of us would be like, yes, Jesus, come to my house. If the servant is going to be healed, then Jesus, you have to come to my house. But not with the centurion. He was broken before the Lord. He was humble. He was lowly. And he said to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Listen to this. That's a soldier. And all you can do he says, all you have to do, Jesus, is speak the word and my servant will be healed. Just Jesus said, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. Notice Jesus said great faith. Now, what is great faith? Well, I believe that it's faith that doesn't walk by sight or by feelings, but by the word of God. It's faith that believes the Bible and does it. It's faith that knows that with God all things are possible. It's faith that believes God against all odds, against all circumstances, whether I'm standing in front of the Red Sea or the Jordan River or in front of Goliath. In fact, I believe it's faith like David when he stood up against that giant. In the natural, David was no match against this giant Philistine. David did not uh, did not have armor. He didn't have experience. He was a young boy, probably about 17 years old. In the natural, most would place their bets on Goliath. This giant would tear David to pieces. But that's in the natural. But now, in the supernatural, things are a little different. See, we don't live by the natural. We live by the supernatural. We don't live by the things we see. We live by the things that we know according to God's Word. Somebody help me today. We don't live by what we see. We don't live by what we feel. We live by what that we know. Hallelujah. This word, this book tells me this is what I live by. This is what I believe right here. You will not change it. Come on, church. David didn't have any armor. He didn't have experience. He didn't have the knowledge. He didn't have the strength. He didn't have the skill. But this little 17-year-old boy had faith. Uh, wait a minute now. Hold on now. Uh, is there anybody here that's 17? Anybody in this? Stand up. You 17, stand up. All right, David. Hey, man. All right, David. 
Now, now David, you 17 also? Wow, man, that's awesome. Okay, that's right. Anybody else 17? I'm glad you stood up, Mimi. I'm proud of you, girl. You're 17. You, boy, I tell you what, you, you, you're awfully mature for 17. Amen. 17 years old. Now, think about this. You got, you got, you got 17-year-old David. He has no experience, has no armor, and he comes up against this huge sit down. He comes up against this huge giant Goliath. He comes up against this huge giant. All of Israel is afraid. Saul is afraid. And he comes up against this giant. But he had faith. See, faith does that. He had the faith in God. Faith in God's power. Faith in the God of Israel. Can you imagine what one person can do in this city? What one church can do in this city? If they just had the faith of David? Listen to me. I'm not talking about games. I'm not talking about just uh, theatrics and things like this. I'm not talking about just making the church busy. But I'm talking about a faith that'll bring down giants, faith that'll break down barriers, faith that'll bring down walls, faith that'll move heaven, faith that'll stop Jesus in his tracks. Amen. I'm talking about faith, faith. Oh, goodness. We understand your pastor, his family wouldn't be here if it wasn't for faith. And man didn't call me here. I'd have left after six months. I, I, I have run uh, into some interesting folks through the years. <laughs> Not everybody is gospel friendly. <laughs> Sister Laura Lee, I'm saying that a lot better than I did when I first started, didn't I? <laughs> Pastor, there's another way you can say things to get the word across without the way you do. You got to get some of the beginning days. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Amen. Now listen to David's faith. Listen to it. He said to the giant, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That's the kind of faith. Do you see it? Do you hear it? There's, there's a certain ring to it. That's what faith sounds like. That's what, that's what faith does. See, David ran towards that great giant Philistine and took a stone out of a sack and put it in a sling and slung it toward the giant. And the rock hit Goliath right between the eyes. And that day, the giant was taken down and David had the victory. And listen, my friend, there might be some Philistines in your life that need to be taken down. Some of us need to rise up and put a stone in our slingshot and believe God by faith. And when we do, the giants will come down. The giants will be destroyed. The giants of doubt will come down and fear will come down. The giants of unbelief and anger will come down. The giants of, uh, of lust and pride and selfishness will come down. These are giants that need to be taken down in our lives. Take the stone, put it in the sling, and cast Cast it by faith. And listen, my friend, because of the centurion's faith, his servant was healed. He wasn't even an Israelite. He wasn't a descendant, a descendant of David or of Abraham. He was a centurion soldier. He was a Gentile in the Roman army. But he believed God. You mean Jesus? Jesus answered the prayer of a Roman soldier? Are you kidding me? He's not even a part of our denomination. He goes to that church. Mm -hmm. God will come to anybody that has faith. Jesus said, go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the Bible said his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. I believe that due to our lack of believing and our lack of faith and our lack of trusting in God's word, we hold back the blessings of God upon our lives. You can't blame other people. You can't blame your church. You can't blame your pastor. We hold back 
Now, the pastor should be preaching the word of God. He should be telling the people, yes, that's true. But many times we hold back the blessings of God. The Bible tells us that there's more. God says there's more. So why don't we believe him for more? What's holding you back? Why are you holding back? What, why aren't you giving your all or, 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 or stepping out of the boat into the walking on water? Why aren't you putting the stone in the sling and casting it towards that July? Why, why, what's holding you back from more? Oh, God, help us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Believe him for more. Jesus says, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you'll receive them and you will have them. Sometimes we want to make faith so hard. We want to make it so difficult. But what God is looking for is a faith that will believe him like a child, a childlike faith, a simple trust, believing. Jesus said, unless we become as a child, I believe God is trying to tell us something. He's saying that, 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 that he's saying that I, I see every need, that with God, nothing is impossible. So believe him. And believe by faith and walk by faith and ask by faith. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the Lord who will provide. God shows us in his word. Hey man, you, you, you have a little bit of meal, but you make it a cake and you give it to the prophet and God gives you so much that you never run out of supply. God provides everything. Hey man, hallelujah. By the ravens, he'll bring the meat and the bread by the, by the brook chair. God will provide. You got to trust him. You got to believe. Step out by faith. We're living too much in the natural, in the carnal, in the fleshly world that we can see, smell, and touch and taste. That God says there's another world that's a whole lot better. It's in Him we live and move and have our being. I I have a book and. You, you guys going anywhere today? <laughs> I'm trying to tell you that this church was not birthed out of a split of another church. Uh, this church was not birthed out of uh, people being disgruntled and a fighting and, and people just wanting it their way. This, this church was not birthed like that. This church was birthed out of a call, out of a conviction. God, God called me. I went through four and a half years of Bible college, and God brought us up to Bluffton. I wasn't planning on, I, I didn't want to start a church, actually. I'll be honest with you. I, that's another story. You guys keep you here till 3 o'clock telling the story. I tried to go in another denomination, but God wouldn't let me. I signed the papers and everything, just had to turn them in. And the day I went to turn them in, I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to go turn these papers in. And she gave me that, you know, you can if you want to. I said, well, what is that supposed to mean? Well, you just obey God. <laughs> I have a book that's written here for about uh, the beginning days of Jimmy Swaggart. And the book is called To Cross a River. This is out of print. I don't know if they've reprinted this lately, but this particular title, this book is out of print. So this doesn't go far from me, but... It's just amazing to see the hand of God upon Jimmy Swire's life at a young age and how God used him and how God blessed him, how God provided for him. Not that it was easy because it wasn't. He endured many hardships of ministry, but God was always faithful. And in the book, he tells the story about his grandmother and his grandfather who lived during the war times in Faraday, Louisiana. And this is the place where Jimmy Swaggart was born, place he was raised. It was just a small town, but a great deal of Brother Swaggart's faith came from watching his grandmother pray and touch God. I mean, he would walk up to the house, and he could hear her crying out to God and praying, uh, just seeking the face of God. And that spoke to him. And I, I, I can't tell you how, much, how important our example is to our younger generation. We need people like Brother Swaggart's grandmother that will pray and cry out to God. Let the young generation hear the church is losing uh, the fact that it needs to pray. It, it doesn't pray anymore. It'd rather perform. It'd, it'd rather do theatrics than to pray and, and to seek the face of God or to fast. But, but Brother Swaggart, he saw his grandmother. He learned from her, her faith, her, her persistence, her cry, her praying. He learned this. And she told Brother Swaggart, her grandson, we serve a big God, so believe for big things. He's a big God. Believe big, Jimmy. Believe big. But although Brother Swigert's grandmother was saved and Holy Ghost filled believer in Christ, his grandfather was not. His grandfather was the sheriff of Faraday, but also he was a farmer and he was a tough man. He was a strong man. He was a man's man, if you know what I mean. 
he didn't mess with this guy. And they said that he could go into a bar room and break up a fight without a gun. He was tough. He was tough, tough. And one year they were going through a drought. It had not rained in some time and some of the crops were dying. He had about 10 acres of land which he planted cotton. But without the rain, everything would dry up and they would lose quite a bit of money. So Brother Swigert's grandmother asked her husband that if God sends the rain, will you pay tithe on your cotton? He said, if God sends the rain, honey, I'll do just that. He'd pay tithe on his crop. And so she grabbed him and took him off to the pastor's house, the Assembly of God Church that she attended there in Faraday. And she told the pastor that if God sends the rain, my husband, he will pay tithe on the cotton. Well, that got the pastor all excited. And so she prayed right there, the three of them, believing God to send the rain. And when she prayed, she knew that God heard and she knew that God would answer. And so she stopped. She said, it's done. God is going to send the rain. That's it. So they went home. And when they went home, she went and got out the rain barrels. Now, we, we don't know too much about rain barrels here these days, but they still have rain barrels. And, and whenever it would rain, they, would use, they used to put the rain barrels out to catch the rain so they could have extra water to do the washing and, and to water the plants and so forth. And so she got out her rain barrels and cleaned them out and set them in her yard. And people would come by and look as if she was so, kind of strange. And they'd ask her, what are you doing? And she told them, she said that I'm cleaning out the rain barrels because she's getting ready for the rain. And so they looked at her kind of strange. Her husband thought she's losing it. What are you doing? It rain is dry as dust. Crops are dying out there. Clean out your rain barrels. But she believed God at his word. And they, they prayed and she believed that God was going to send rain. And so they went to bed kind of early in those days. And so they went to bed that night and in the middle of the night, they woke up. You can read the book yourself. You can see it in there. They woke up in the middle of the night to thundering and lightning, and it began to rain. The rain came just as God said to her that it would come. So God answered, and God blessed, and God met that need. Now, listen. The Scripture says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. In other words, rain will come. God will pour out. God will bless. God will meet. God will answer prayer. Hallelujah. I believe that. You see, I believe that a great deal of our problem today is that we have put away our rain barrel. Some of us has stored them away. Perhaps we've sold them at a garage sale. And the church is no longer believing God for the rain. She prayed and then she prepared. Listen, my beloved. We've got to learn to pray and then prepare. Pray and then prepare. Pray and then prepare. Hallelujah. What am I saying we need to do is we need to get out our rain bales and believe God for more. I'm going to my garage. I'm going to my attic. I'm going to my backyard. I'm going to the shed. And I'm going to get out my rain barrel. Here it is. I prayed. Now I'm preparing for more. I'm believing God for more. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Get out your rain barrels. Amen. Get out your rain barrels and clean them out. Prepare your barrels for rain. Believe God to answer your prayer. Do what Jesus said. Have faith in God, you see. See, all right, first of all, number one, you got to pray. Number two, you got to prepare. Number three is that this is what you got to do. You got to get out your rain barrel. Go find it. Amen. This one we found at Myers, $16. You got to get your rain barrel. You're, you're, you're praying, but you don't have a rain barrel. You're not believing. You're not preparing. You're praying some kind of prayer just to hear yourself pray, just to give you some kind of satisfaction that I prayed for 15 minutes today, so therefore I'm okay with God. But you're not getting your rain barrels out. You're not doing anything with it. You're not expecting, not believing, not preparing. So, the first thing you got to do is you find your rain barrel. You got to get all the junk out of it. Because this is what happens to Christians these days. Trash. Trash in their mind. Trash in their heart. We got trash everywhere. Trash. Coming in with trash. Trashy Christians. 
everywhere. Get the trash out. Lord, I forgive me. God, I repent of that lust. I repent of that anger. That pizza was good, Lord, but it wasn't good for me. I know. I, I repent. He will give abundantly more than we ask. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for a sour attitude, for holding anger in my heart and life clean. I repent. I come to you. And now what we have is a clean barrel. Now we got a barrel that is prepared for the rain. You see, you are the barrel, your heart, the vessel of God. The Holy Ghost dwells within your heart. And we got to come to God and say, God, forgive me for all my sin. Forgive me for doubt. Forgive me for, for unbelief. Forgive me, God, for not believing the Word of God. Clean me out. Clean me out. And now you come and say, God, I'm ready. Now, God, send the rain. Send the rain. What are you doing, Pastor? Why did you come to Marion? Because I put out my barrel. I'm believing God to send the rain. Send the rain. Hallelujah. What are you doing, preacher? I'm preparing for the rain. Hallelujah. I'm believing God for more. Praise God. All right, Abby, get in here. No, just kidding. <laughs> oh, come on, Mark. Hallelujah. Hey, man, I'm preparing for rain. I'm preparing for more. Hallelujah. That's what this church is. My wife and I came here and we set out the barrels and we're preparing for rain. And they came and God saves them. And God, God did a mighty work. Some of them are already in heaven with Jesus in the presence of God. Get the junk out of your life. Amen. Get rid of the things that hinder you from being filled up with God. And let God fill the rain barrel. Let God fill it up. Let God pour out the blessing. Let Him fill you up. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and life more abundantly. What y'all doing this afternoon? All right, come on. Now, a lot of times, God can't fill up the rain barrels because there's so much trash. Look at this. Look at this. Trash. Trash in the marriage. Trash in the kids. Trash on the phone. Trash on the computer. Trash in the heart. Our barrels are filled with dirt, spider webs, debris, cobwebs. We quit believing by faith, and somewhere along the way, we quit believing. From, well, that's where a lot of churches are right here. They get stagnant. They get trashy. They don't believe. Folks, I want to tell you something. There's blessing in that rain barrel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. We got all the trash out. That's the hard part. You get all that trash out of your life, out of your heart, out of your head. You get all that trash out of you, God's going to fill it up. He said, now I've got something to fill up. I can't, I, can't, I can't fellowship with all that garbage in there. I can't do that. No, uh God said, no, no, I can't do that. There's blessing in that rainbow, uh, rain barrel. Amen. There's a baptism in the Holy Ghost in it. There's joy in it. There's peace in it. There's love. Somebody hear me today. There's power in it. There's answered prayer in it. There's the former and the latter rain in it. There's the refilling. There's needs met in it. Bills are paid. Souls are saved. Bondages are broken. And marriages are restored in that barrel. Hallelujah. Somebody shout. Oh, yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Clean it out. Sit. Be honest with me. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. Look at this up here. Look at this trash. Does that represent our heart today? Our life? I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not here to nothing like that. I'm here to help you. See, there's, there's help. There's hope. And it's Jesus. Jesus said, if you'll come to me and you'll confess to me, I'll get all that junk out of your life. I'll get that, all that garbage out of there. You have to get your barrel out of storage. You have to start believing God for more. You have to have faith in God. You have to walk by faith, not by sight or circumstance. Believe big because He's a big God. Now listen, Jesus said, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Was it verse 21 there? Verse 22? Matthew 21? 22? Yeah. Everything in this church and ministry has been a step of faith. Everything. I'm telling you, from buying this building 
to purchasing the bus, to building the garage, to buying the vans and the bus, to believing for the property that's now ours on the side in the back, to paying all the bills, to supporting your pastor's family. And it's going to take stepping out by faith and believing for a building over there on the corner for the boys' ministry. We're back here for the building and what God wants to do in this ministry. I want you to know that so many people, and you'll see that it's in the presentation in the 20 minutes, of so many people that came through this ministry, this church. So many people's lives were touched. So many had the opportunity to hear the gospel, the truth, and to experience the love of Christ through loving people like you. That people in Marion are watching us. They're watching us in a good way. Maybe some are not. I don't know about them. I'm sure we always have enemies. You never, Jesus had them too. But, but they're watching us, and they, they see the property, and they see how clean and how nice it is. and they, they're, they're just kind of seeing what's going to happen. And I got a letter yesterday from Ohio State Taxation, and they said, you're exempt. <laughs> they said in the letter, the case is closed. And so I just feel the Holy Ghost is helping us. You see? Amen. All right. Mm. Abby, would you would you come up here? Amen. I can't tell you how grateful my wife and I are that you joined and are here today to celebrate with us because we want to celebrate with you. But if we would stand here today. And all that was said and all that was done, just I want you to get a visual of this, okay? I want you to look at this in the front. I just, I want, I'm here to help you. Jesus wants to help you. Don't, don't think that Jesus has turned against you. Don't think that he hates you. Don't think that he has a big bat stick ready to hit you over the head. Don't, don't think that at all. Jesus came to help us. But we have to do it his way. We have to do it his way. He came to forgive you. He came to save you. He came to wash you. He came to sanctify you. He came that he might have fellowship with you, relationship, to dwell in your heart. But a lot of us, let's be honest, let's look up here. And a lot of us are saying, you know, Pastor, that kind of represents my heart. I, trashy thinking. I'm looking at trashy things. I'm thinking trashy thoughts. Um, there's trashy anger, tra trashy rebellion, just trashy things that I know that's not pleasing to God. I know it's not. Trashy excuses. Um, you know. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me ask you, my friend. Maybe you're saying, Pastor Mark, I feel like God's talking to me. I feel like He's showing me. And Pastor, I just want you to pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Would you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just lift your hand. Thank you. Thank you. God's talking to me. God's talking to me. Okay. All right. You can put your hands down. You're here today and say, Pastor, I'm not saved. I am not saved. I'm not living for God. I'm not saved. I know I'm not saved. But I want to give my heart to Christ today. I want to pray and ask Jesus into my heart. If that's you today, would you lift your hand? Would you lift your hand? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? I want to give my heart to Jesus today. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Anybody? Come on. I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you. Talk. Be honest. Come on. God, the Holy Ghost is speaking to you. God's talking to you. Right now, you can be saved. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on. God's dealing with you. You know. Right here. Let's do it. I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. Anybody? Just raise your hand. Let me see your hand real quick. Real quick. I got it. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I feel that God is speaking. Come on. Anybody else? Somebody say, Pastor Mark, my heart's trashy. I want God to clean it out. I want to clean out the barrel. If that's you, raise your hand. My heart's trashy. I need God's help. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's okay. I, I see it. I'm with you. 
I'm here to help you. I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on, be honest. It's trashy. I need to get it all cleaned out. I need to get it done. I got to bring it to the Lord once and for all. I'm going to do it. All right, church. Hallelujah. Who in this church will step out in that Jordan River with me in the coming years? Who will do it? Who will go the extra mile with me to preach this gospel of Christ? Who will believe God to take down the giants? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who will believe God? Who will ask God for the impossible with me? Oh, yes. Yes. Who will get out their rain barrels with me and believe God for more rain? Who will do it? Hallelujah. 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 Word of life. God has us on a journey. A journey. We're going to bring down giants. We're going to see children saved and families saved and delivered by the power of God. I know the devil will fight, but my God's bigger than the devil. Hallelujah. 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 Do you feel it rise up in you? Do you feel the faith rising up in you? Do you feel the strength of God rising up in you? You are chosen of God. That's what the Bible says. Nothing crazy. You're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. That's what Peter said. Listen. If you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, you feel that you need to come and talk to Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come, won't you step out of your, 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 your split? Why don't you come out of your pew? Why don't you come up here? I want you to find a place to pray. Just come on. You raise your hand. That's right. Can I have some help me right here with, with Jackie? Help me. Any, yeah, come on. Come on. You, you, come on. Come on, come on. You tell me. You're telling me that, that there's, there's nothing in your heart that you have to deal with. Maybe you got to bring down some giants. Maybe you got to bring down some giants. Bring them down. Bring them down. Bring down some giants. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? You're going to bring down the giants. Say, man, we're going to believe God for more. You're going to get out your rain barrels. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Come help me pray this morning. Come help me believe God for more this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we need your touch right now, Father. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. We praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God, do the work in our hearts and lives. We pour it out to you. We give it all to you. We are holding nothing back, Father. We bear our heart to you. We bear our life to you. We give everything to you, God. In the name of the Lord, and we're asking you to clean out the rain barrel so that you can fill it with the living water, so that you can fill it with yourself, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus. I'm believing God to bring down the giants. I'm believing God for more. I'm believing God for victory. I'm believing God for your power. I'm believing God that you're going to do this work of grace in my heart and life. Hallelujah. I'm believing right now in the name of Jesus. I'm believing the devil's trying to steal my joy, steal my faith. But I'm believing for more. I'm believing for more. I'm believing for more. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm believing right now to bring down these giants and to clean out this rain barrel. I pray in the name of Jesus. Do this work, God, I pray in my heart and my life, Father. God, I praise you. Lord, I worship you. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, work. Work, God, work. Work, God, in our hearts and lives. Work in us, Lord. Work in us. Work in our hearts. Lord, we belong to you. Hallelujah. Just have the rest of the church just pray for these. Reach your hands out up here. Just pray in the name of the Lord. God is working. God is doing a deep work. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for holding us together. Thank you for bringing us thus far. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel of Christ. Thank you for changing lives. Thank you for saving souls. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. God, we bless you. We worship you. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, oh God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, oh Father God, I pray, Lord God, Holy Spirit, do this do this. We pour our heart out to you. I am yours. I belong to Jesus. I will live for God. I will live for the Lord. I will live for the gospel of Christ. I will live for my Savior. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory.